Hey guys, it's Joel. Um, yesterday I talked about a couple different models of psychotherapy that come up a lot of people aren't familiar with or haven't heard of. Um, we went over CBT, uh, DBT, psychoanalysis, EMDR, and brain spotting. So some others that may come up for you or that may be helpful for, for you. And again, this series is kind of to go over um, if you're a practitioner who's new to the field, you may hear this stuff come around or you may hear techniques, but you're not really sure which model or school they're a part of. If you're a patient, you may just be looking to get into therapy with somebody. You don't know what all the letters and stuff in their profile is, so you, you may not know which model you want to seek out is best for you or that you're most comfortable with based on therapy that you've heard about or read about um, or the pro specific problem that you're having. So hopefully this is helpful, and if you have any questions, please reach out to me. I'm happy to answer. I um, want everyone to get into therapy with the best therapist for them. So happy to uh, answer any questions after this is over. Um, one of the models that we didn't go over yesterday is something that's called Jungian analysis. And this is an old model, you know, just like with Freud. Um, Jung's one of the early guys. Uh, Freud kind of starts off and he wants to find people to replace him as his kind of disciples that he sees as carrying on his legacy. Yet he is threatened by all of their ideas and all of their um, innovations. <laughs> on his model and so for the rest of Freud's life he finds a pupil gets very close to them has a falling out with them and then finds another pupil rinse and repeat he does this with Jung he does this with Adler um, they this is kind of what happens so you know Jung is seen originally as kind of a part of the Freudian school and then he splits from it and goes in a different direction. Um, you know, Freud is very interested in looking at sexual and violent urges that are repressed or formed during childhood. Jung is much more interested in the whole mind. Um, he's not just interested in these repressed sexual and violent urges in the unconscious. He sees the unconscious as kind of a bigger thing. Um, Jung says that we have a collective unconscious which means that we all share, because we have a shared DNA and a shared brain and a shared you know, genetic legacy, certain symbols that are deep within our unconscious that come out when we think about certain things, when we tell stories, when we make religions, when we make myths, when we make legends. And um, Jung works with patients that have schizophrenia um, at the beginning of his life. And so when he's working with them institutionally, he realizes a lot of these people are homeless, they have no education, they've been impoverished their whole life, and yet they're dreaming of like a bull mating with the sun, and then it births this child, and this is, you know, uh, Persian mythology, or somebody with schizophrenia is having a, uh, a delusion um, that looks a lot like a Zoroastrian myth, and so he's going, you know, this is too consistent, these symbols that are in these myths you know, it's not just a coincidence that they keep repeating. There's something about the deep unconscious mind that understands things symbolically through these stories. So Jungian analysis is a lot about looking at that. Um, I, I like Jungian analysis. I use it. I don't use it with everybody. Um, I pay for a Jungian analyst. I see one. Um, so uh, I, I think that what I enjoy about it is that it's very growth-oriented. A lot of um, therapy models that are recent have to do with reducing symptoms, right? And insurance likes that. Um, a lot of the union or parts-based psychologies have to do with, you know, re finding energy patterns or getting in touch with uh, repressed self archetypes, and insurance doesn't really like to pay for that. Um, but I think it's interesting, I think it's useful. Um, I wouldn't use it right away. I wouldn't use it for every person. You know, if somebody comes in and they say that they want to quit biting their nails, I'm not going to do psychoanalysis or Jungian analysis. Um, but for bigger long-term goals uh, and, and personal and identity growth, I think it's a, a really useful tool. Um, there's a lot of dream work with Jungian analysis because Jung looked at all these different characters through myths and stories and said, okay, these are archetypes. These are kind of these constructions of human experience. The trickster that you know, breaks society and con confronts authority, but also makes paves the road for new growth. You know, this is Loki. 
or this is Wiley e. Coyote, or you know, these are these are things that pop up a whole lot. Um, so, like, for example, I had a meeting with a practitioner who's a real uh, big deal in the field, and I was insecure about it on some level. And so I met with him, and I it, well, meeting went pretty well, and I felt flattered that I got to have that meeting. And then the next morning, I dreamed that I was like a Joseph Lord and Gordon Levitt character from like a spy movie, and I was breaking into like a college. And I don't remember what my mission was or whatever, but I was breaking into it. And so an analysis, having looked at that, I kind of realized that I was seeing myself as somebody who didn't really deserve to be there, who hadn't really made it yet, was breaking into the school to, I don't know, you know, was a, it, it was about imposter syndrome, essentially. So, I mean, union analysis is very broad. I mean, this is the kind of thing that you do. Um what it paves the way for are other parts-based psychologies that I really like and I use more often. Um, IFS, or internal family systems, is one. Um, internal family systems is kind of looking at all those voices in your head like they're a family and fleshing them out. Um, I talk a lot about uh, the inner critic and the vulnerable child and the pusher self. Um, these parts of the personality, but we all have ones that are unique to us too, because in later life we don't all have a similar experience like most of us do in early life. There's also some trauma-based protective parts some of the time. We may have a part of our personality, like if you're a child and you have a very damaging experience, you may realize that there's no one to protect you, that you're all alone, that you can't deal with your reality because you're too young to be able to do it, so you create this protective part that dissociates and shuts you down and takes you out of the experience. And maybe that keeps you from being psychotic or keeps you alive because a part of you is formed to be a parent, basically, if the parent isn't there or isn't able to protect you. So this protective part is made as a kid, when you're a kid and it's able to come in and, and uh, you know, shut off this traumatic experience. But then in adulthood that dissociation or that panic attack or that disability to feel my arm. Maybe I lose feelings in my body. Um, maybe I have a repressed memory. It can look a lot of different ways. Is is not helping. And we have to kind of go into the self and start to find that vulnerable child who's very damaged from this early experience, who a lot of times is still very scared and still very sad and make contact. And a lot of times people you know, hate these parts of themselves because it's hurting them. It's an addiction or it's a gambling problem or um, it's a, a panic or a rage that they take out on their family and they are very ashamed of these parts and they hate them. Um, internal family systems or voice dialogue. Voice dialogue is another model that's extremely similar to internal family systems. I use a lot too. Um, they're both very union. They both come from that kind of parts-based archetypal understanding of the self. Um, but we can't hate these parts because they're us. In order to heal, we have to accept them. And so a whole lot of that kind of therapy is working with people to say, you know, yeah, this part of you has done these terrible things in your life or done these terrible things to you or other people, but this part of you is also four. And it's a scared child and it's having a temper tantrum. And it's still having that temper tantrum. And you have to be able to go in and you have to be able to accept it and to love it. Um, and, and, and cultivating radical compassion for the self, for the parts of ourself that are part of that Jungian idea of our shadow, or the part of our personality that's in the unconscious that we don't want to accept. We have to realize that it is us, we have to love it, and we have to have compassion for the parts of ourselves that we don't want to own in that way, in order to heal a whole lot of the time. Um, and there's a lot of other parts to IFS and voice dialogue, this is a big system. But in general, uh, one of the big ideas of understanding it is looking at all those voices in your head and the kind of inner critic that's a perfectionist, the pusher self that says, just keep moving forward. Just don't stop feeling, emo don't stop and slow down and feel emotion. That's going to be scary. Just keep moving. Um, all of those things want to be a tyranny. And when they're in charge, if we're not aware of them, they're totally in control of everything. But we need it to be a democracy. We need to know wh what those are, where they come from, when they're active, and to be able to switch them on and off. And sometimes it's exploring that through artwork. Um, sometimes <clears throat> there's a lot of different ways to get in touch with that creativity. But those are what Jungian analysis, internal family systems, and voice dialogue look like. 
hope that was helpful and I will talk to you guys tomorrow.